You're listening to audio from the Village Church, a community that's formed by the gospel and sent on God's mission, gathering weekly in the heart of downtown Hamilton, Ohio. For more information about the village or to connect with us, you can find us online at myvillagechurch.com. Good morning. As mentioned, my name's David. I'm one of the deacons here. And as Adam said, I'm a pastoral candidate. So being my first time preaching, I covet your prayers and grace uh, as I have some big shoes to fill. Super thankful for these men who preach God's word and for the opportunity to partake in this privilege. It's not an easy thing to do and I'm humbled to be trusted with something as weighty as God's word. So like we talked, he was saying, if you're new here, you don't maybe know me that well. We've been part of the family here for over 10 years. I'm married to Stacy, who's the coolest person I know. And I have three beautiful children, Kate, uh, Jada, and Hudson, who are 17, 12, and eight, respectively. Kate's right there, and my goal today is to be engaging enough to keep her awake, because she was out late at the Taylor Swift concert last night, as I think some of you may have been this weekend as well. Um, And if you were here last week, you probably saw Hudson get baptized, which was a really sweet moment. If your eyes were dry, I can assure you mine were not. So today we're wrapping up our second and final tour through the gospel according to John. We started this series in late 2021 before taking a break last year and coming back to finish it this year. It's been a wonderful journey through a glorious book. So as we wrap it up today, we're going to look at how this passage fits with and underlines the same central message that we've been hearing about throughout this series. But before we get into that, I want to open us up with prayer. Father, thank you for just this beautiful body of people. Thank you for your holy word. Thank you that we get to sit under it and that we get to learn and that your spirit is here and present with and in us. I pray for your grace to be on my words. God, we know your word doesn't return void. But Lord, we pray that your spirit would apply it to our hearts and to our minds, and that we would believe and that we would grow and love in you. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. So a couple weeks ago, my wife asked me to round up the kids and clean up the pool toys and the floats from the backyard before the mowers were to come the next day. So I grabbed Hudson and proceeded to look for Jada. I looked upstairs, downstairs. I looked everywhere. I couldn't find her. Before I finally remembered, oh, yeah, she's on a date with her Nana. Okay. So I said, okay, Hudson, Jada's not here, so I'll help you clean the backyard. Hudson immediately shot back, wait, Jada isn't going to have to clean? That's not fair. Not fair. One of our absolute favorite phrases we hear the kids say all the time. It's time to get up. That's not fair. It's time to go to bed. That's not fair. It's time to go to church. Not fair. It's time to leave, for, leave church. Not fair. So we've basically started to treat not fair like it's a curse word in our house. But back to Hudson and the backyard chore. First of all, I thought, you were going to have to do this either way, buddy. I'm the one that is suffering because she's not here. So he argued with me. I tried to explain that whether or not Jada was here, he still benefited from the backyard, and thus he shared responsibility to keeping it clean. I'm not sure he ever agreed, but this story reminded me of one of the things we see in today's passage. Instead of focusing on his mission at hand, Hudson, like Peter, got distracted by something irrelevant, what somebody else was asked or required to do. And the irony is we spent more time arguing over this than it actually took us to round up the different items. Hudson was acting like cleaning the backyard was going to be this huge, hard thing, when in reality it took us maybe two minutes. All the hard work necessary for him to enjoy the backyard, it had already been done. It's been built, it's been maintained and filled with toys. Um, He just needs to do the little bit that we ask him to do. We do this with our faith, whether it's believing for the first time or continuing in our faith on this journey with Jesus. We act like it's just so hard. It's just too much, and we allow distractions to sidetrack us. 
Or maybe we refuse to believe in the first place. Or maybe we lose our faith altogether. But we need to remember that answering the call to believe isn't hard. Continuing to believe isn't hard. What Jesus did was hard. And the beautiful thing for us is that he already did the hard thing so that we don't have to. Jesus told us that he came so that we could have life and have it abundantly. We now get to live in that abundant life and reap the reward in this life and the next as we seek to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And that's our big idea today. Belief in Jesus is the key to initial faith, daily struggle, and forever joy. Which brings me to my first point, resist distraction. So let's read, starting in verse 20. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had also leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? So we see Peter succumb to distraction. But let's set the context here before we dive into this. If you were here with us last week, you will recall that immediately preceding this, Jesus has reinstated Peter by three times asking him if he loved him. John even tells us that Peter was hurt that Jesus had asked him three times and finally responded with, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. To which Jesus proceeds to tell Peter that he will eventually glorify Jesus by dying a crucified death. Jesus then finishes the exchange with, follow me. So naturally, after such a heart-wrenching interchange, Peter would immediately go, yeah, what's going to happen to John, though? Like, what? But to be fair to Peter, and add a little more context, Peter and John were close. In fact, verse 20 reminds us that Peter had whispered to John at the Last Supper to ask Jesus about the impending betrayal. We see them often mentioned together in the Gospels, and John is often mentioned in close proximity to Jesus. Not to mention, we see him sitting right next to Jesus at the Last Supper. And can I just say, like, do any of you all geek out with me a little bit that John leaned back onto Jesus? Like, man, he was that close to our risen Lord. Can you imagine? Anyway, so you can kind of see what's in Peter's mind, right? He's going, if I'm going to be crucified, what's going to happen to John? But we will see shortly that Jesus rebukes Peter for this. And you can understand why. Jesus had literally just reinstated Peter, cut him to the heart, and finished with a direct command, follow me. Only for Peter to say, yeah, but what about him? Was this a mere curiosity or was there like an incoming, but that's not fair. To be called into service, to serve the Lord's anointed, the living Christ, and more than that, to be reinstated after having denied him three times out of fear, yet Jesus still calls him. What grace. But what about him? What about my friend? Will he have to die the way I do? Or do you love him more than you love me? Why doesn't he have to be crucified? Peter's not focused on following Jesus in this moment. He's focused on John. And I would offer that he's focused on himself. This isn't fair, he might have been thinking. But are we any different? Like Peter, we too have been called to follow Jesus, which we'll talk more about when we get to the second point. Yet who among us hasn't fallen victim to distraction? We also succumb to distraction. (laughs) Marion Webster tells us that distraction is when something directs one's attention away from something else. And I love that a number of synonyms speak to how disordered this is for us. Words like bewildered, confused, discombobulation, which is my favorite, Head scratching, perplexity, they sum up the thought that distraction is not healthy. It's not just a lack of focus, but it's pulling us into an unclear state of ineffectiveness. It reminds me of James' warning about not being a double minded man, whom he says is unstable in all his ways. So, what distracts us? 
It can be any number of things. It can be jealousy or comparison with your fellow man or woman. It can be speculating about irrelevant or unhealthy things. It can be your current circumstances. It can be others' voices that tickle your ears or maybe cause you fear. It can even be godly things. But Lord, why can't I have a job or a house like he has? It's not fair, God. I strive and I strive and I just can't do what she's able to do. I try to lead a pretty righteous life. He seems like a godly man, but did you hear who he voted for? <laughs> hey, have you seen that so-and-so hasn't been at church in over a month? I have a theory. I should probably spend some time with the Lord today, but I think I'm good. I did that a couple weeks ago. I'm pretty busy. New season dropped on Netflix. I'm sure it's fine. How come you're not concerned about what's happening? The world is burning down before our eyes. God, why does she get to hear your voice speak to her? I've asked for that gift, and it's just not fair. Notice that in all these examples, in one way or another, the focus is on something other than God. Whether that's missing the sovereign nature of his grace, ignoring his good commands, forgetting his goodness, or ignoring his call for your life. It's rooted in lack of contentment and failure to believe. And I want to be clear, while Jesus did the hard work, the day after day Christian life is not a walk in the park. We are living in this in-between state where we get to enjoy God's kingdom now, but it's not yet perfected. And that includes us. So church, be encouraged. We are still being sanctified. As the SV Gospel Transformation Bible says, a fully restored Peter is not a fully transformed Peter. I love that. The same can be said for us. So then how do we respond? We turn to the Lord in repentance. What's interesting is that Peter here literally turned away from Jesus to look at John. It may have been a real-life physical turning away from Jesus towards a distraction, but it has real spiritual significance too. The reason that Peter shifted his focus off of Jesus is because he shifted his focus off of Jesus. Had he continued to fix his eyes on the risen Lord to focus on literally following him in this moment, he wouldn't have had time or capacity to focus on something else. This isn't the first time we've seen Peter do this. It calls to mind Matthew 14 where Jesus is walking on the water and Peter comes out to him also walking on the water until he takes his eyes off Jesus to focus on the wind and the waves. Stay close to Jesus and you'll be less likely to give in to distraction. Kelly O'Don shared a great illustration with me about what it means to follow Jesus. She said, think about when you're following someone in a car. If you don't stay close enough, you will lose them and not be able to follow them. We need to stay close to Jesus. And I also think that it's interesting that this real yet symbolic turning away from Jesus is the wrong side of repentance. We often discuss how repentance looks like turning away from something and turning toward God. But in this instance, Peter does the opposite, literally. And so do we. But the remedy is simple. It's to repent. And that's Jesus' response. You follow me. To follow Jesus, Peter has to turn back toward him and away from his distraction. Likewise for us. But Lord, why can't I have a job or a house like his? What's it to you if I give him that to glorify me, you follow me. God, why does she get to hear your voice speak to her? I've asked for that gift and it's just not fair. What's it to you how I choose the gifts of grace that I, gl I give to glorify me? You follow me. The other side of repentance is faith. And that leads us to our second point. Answer the call to believe. Let's read starting in verse 22. Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? 
This is the disciple who's bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So there's a few things going on here, so I'm going to spend a little bit more time under point number two as I want to expand the conversation to talk about the Gospel of John as a whole. The first thing we see, though, is a call to follow. Jesus rebukes Peter with a call to repentance, as we've already discussed. But I do want to add a word that this should be comforting to us. Yet again, we see poor Peter with one of his gaffes, but Jesus doesn't cut him loose. Like in my heart as a parent, I could totally see myself losing my cool and just being like, you know what? Just don't worry about it. We're not going to the movies if you're going to act this way, right? And then after cooling down, I'd feel like an idiot. But Jesus doesn't do this. He just reiterates the same call. You can imagine the frustration, but he doesn't give up on Peter, and he won't give up on us. He reiterates the call to follow, and through his spirit, we receive the same call to follow over and over, day by day, despite our distractions and our stubbornness. As Pastor Scott said last week, we have a lasting invitation we get to accept daily. But I think it's important that we see something here that is very real for us. Peter's distracted behavior led to consequences, and those consequences required further remediation. Through this exchange with Jesus, the words that our Lord uttered had apparently led some in the time between this historical interaction and John's writing of this gospel to believe that John was not going to die before Jesus would come again. And on the surface, this may seem strange to us, but when we recall some of the things that Jesus said, you can imagine why they might think this and why this school of thought would continue to perpetuate. We can think of Matthew 16, 28, when Jesus says, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Or we think about the times where Jesus says, I am coming soon in the book of Revelation. Not to mention, for a people that would desperately have wanted Jesus to come back, they may have wanted to believe this, thinking that it meant it would happen in John's lifetime. But at the end of the day, what is this? It's further distraction. Instead of focusing on mission, folks were tempted to focus on John as a marker for when Jesus would return. And apparently this distraction was significant enough that John felt the need to spill ink on clarifying what Jesus actually said. And while we know from church history that Peter was indeed crucified, it seems the information about John is mixed, whether he died a martyr's death. Feel free to research, but in preparing for today, I felt the conviction not to be distracted by this, but to focus more on what John is pointing us to. And that's truth, which is my second subpoint. John cares about truth we see that in the way he corrects this misinformation, and we see it in how he proceeds to talk about himself in the third person, which I find fascinating. Again, this might seem a little odd, but I think what John is doing here is important for establishing his credibility. He's telling his readers, which many would have known him or known of him at the time of this writing, that he wrote this gospel and that what he wrote was true. What he's disclosed here is grounded in historical fact, and that truth matters to John. And it's at the height of the purpose of his writing. We've seen him refer to the purpose of his gospel over and over again, and he wants all his readers, including us, to know that his words are truth. See, John was an eyewitness. Having not written this until the end of the first century, he had spent a lifetime reflecting and ruminating on what had happened in front of his eyes and what had happened since Jesus resurrected and ascended. So he writes this masterful account, and it's absolutely critical to him that we know and believe that it's true. Because the most important thing in the entire history of the world is at stake. life in Jesus. Unless we forget, John is in good company. For a few chapters earlier, Jesus says as much. 
when he says, For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Just to be clear, when John says these things, he's talking about the writing of his gospel. And that's where we're going to spend a few minutes to reflect on the beauty of this book and what we've experienced together for the last couple of years. By my count, we've preached 58 sermons from the Gospel of John. And maybe you were here for every single one of these messages. Maybe you've poured over the words of this book along with us. But maybe you haven't. Maybe this is your first time, or maybe you just started coming in the last couple of months. So what's it all about? What does it mean? Well, you're in luck because I'm going to share that with you, and I'm glad you asked. But I do want to warn you at the outset, I won't be able to do full justice to this book. As John Newfeld said on the Help Me Teach the Bible podcast, which is one of my favorites, you should check it out. You, he said, John is not basic stuff, but is the project of a lifetime. So I'll do my best to give a quick survey. John told us in chapter 20 that Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So that's what John wants you to do. He wants you to know this truth and to believe and to have life. But he spends 20 chapters doing this in beautiful, cerebral, and sometimes poetic style. He builds a comprehensive case, employing several witnesses and conventions to persuade us. In chapter 1, John appropriately starts with a prologue of sorts by telling us that Jesus is eternal creator God who was there in the beginning, that he gives life and is the source of light for men and women, that though being God, he came to our world as a man and that those who lived at that time saw his glory, the glory being the revelation of the Father, Revelation of the one true God. John then introduces his first witness, John the Baptist, who came as a witness to the light that all might believe through him. John describes Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and how he, how he hears the Father's pronouncement of worthiness and sees the Spirit descend and remain on Jesus. And then as Jesus calls his disciples, he's referred to as Rabbi, which means teacher, the Messiah, which means Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, which grounds his humanity in reality, the Son of God, which connects him to the Father, the King of Israel, which ties him to the people of God and ultimately to Adam, Abraham, and King David. I'm running out of fingers. And then Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, which is a salvific and eschatological term for the coming King. And that's just the first chapter. Have you lost count of the witnesses? John has already called because I have. Of course he goes on. John demonstrates to us how Jesus completely changes the game. He shows us mastery over the elements of our world as Jesus changes water into wine, the first of seven signs pointing to a greater reality. He upends the political and societal orders as we see one of the Jewish leaders, Nicodemus, come forward to engage and ultimately believe. He shows himself to be the fulfillment and ultimate end of the Jewish religion by fulfilling Jewish festivals and institutions and identifying belief in him as what secures salvation instead of the Mosaic law. He shows his counter-cultural compassion for every kind of man and woman in first century society. Jesus shows his mastery over sickness and death by healing many sick and raising Lazarus from the dead. He shows us mastery over our provision by feeding thousands with a few morsels of food. He demonstrates his transcendence of our world's physical properties by walking on water. Jesus demonstrates his power over sin by living a sinless life and being vindicated via resurrection. I'm not done. Next, John calls Jesus as a witness unto himself. He tells the woman at the well that he is the Messiah. He demonstrates his supernatural knowledge by what he knows and in how he discloses the future before it even happens. He demonstrates his sovereign omnipotence and authority over salvation and judgment. 
He refers to himself as a witness and also is careful to say that others bear witness, including the Father, the Spirit, the Scriptures, his works, and others. And we see several times where John shows how Jesus fulfilled the Scriptures. I imagine he collectively blew the minds of those present when he even calls Moses as a witness to himself, saying that Moses wrote about him. He later adds to this by stating, before Abraham was, I am. Continuing with that language, Jesus makes seven I am statements, fulfilling his deity as the Old Testament God the Jewish people knew. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the true vine. John names many people as witnesses, including Martha, who witnesses to his deity saying, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who's coming into the world. As Jesus enters Jerusalem a week before he dies and resurrects, the Jews praise him saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, referring to him as the King of Israel. We have beat up on our boy Peter a lot in recent weeks, but in chapter 6, he says one of the most evocative lines in the book. When Jesus is saying some truly hard things and asks the disciples if they too are going to leave, Peter utters, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And last but not least, as we have recapped, John describes himself as a witness. Having been there and witnessed Jesus securing salvation for all believed through his perfect life, sacrificial death, very real burial, victorious resurrection, and eventual glorious ascension. And I have to say, I sort of know how John feels. I could go on and on because there's so much just in this one book, but time's limited. I must stop here. So in summary, John and all these witnesses have testified to this, that Jesus is indeed the one true God, and by believing in him, we may have life in his name. All in all, John uses the word witness 47 times, and the word believe 90 times in this gospel. If Ted Lasso were a Christian and not fictional, got to think John would be his favorite book just on account of that. This all culminates in John's gospel is a call to believe. He's calling us to believe. He's calling you to believe. Whether you're here today or watching online, John is calling you to believe, to follow Jesus, and to have life in his name. That said, what that means for your personal situation is unique. Maybe this is your first time considering Jesus, and maybe that means you need to investigate this more. We would love to help you walk that out. Maybe you've thought about this before, but you don't consider yourself a Christian, and it's time for you to choose to believe. We would love to help you through that door. Maybe you consider yourself a Christian, but you haven't been living committed. The Spirit is calling you to fully commit and live that out. We would love to help you take those steps. Or maybe you've been walking faithfully with Jesus, but the struggle is real. Whether that's obvious or subtle distraction, stay close to Jesus. We would love to join you and encourage you in your struggle. For those of us in Christ, the Christian life is one of obedience and sanctification and perseverance. It's a day-by-day walk fighting to stay close to Jesus, to look more like him turning away from sin and bearing fruit, just like in Galatians 5, ignoring the cares of this world and embracing the mission of God, that the goal is to finish this life well. I don't think we talk enough about perseverance. The finish line is when we go to be with the Lord, but we don't stop running until we get there, and we don't slow down. Salvation isn't hitting the finish line, Salvation is the starting block. But don't get me wrong, because there's so much joy in this persevering. I do think I probably picked the wrong analogy, though. 
because I don't really enjoy distant running. Some here probably do. I probably should have picked something different. Anyway, like I said, this life in Jesus isn't burdensome. It's not a reluctant surrender. It's an invitation into everlasting joy. Jesus says as much in John 15, 11. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. And again, in one of my favorite verses in the Bible, in John 10, 10. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Joy, abundant life. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus wants us to have life in his name. That's why I'm saying these things, and that's exactly what I want for every one of you. And that will move us to my last point. There's so much more to life in Jesus. Read with me in verse 25. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So just a personal reflection, I just love that after 21 chapters, um, in the very last sentence, John moves to first person and drops an I suppose. It's almost like he feels guilty for taking one second to identify himself, and he immediately has to shift the spotlight back to Jesus. There are many other things that Jesus did, John says. I can't even imagine. Like to think about all the things written in the four Gospels, from what we understand, they only covered a roughly three-year period of his life, yet we know they don't contain everything. For John told us that at the end of chapter 20. Can you imagine a window into what his life would have looked like? Like when I think about the fact that the perfect son of God was sinless, and in perfect sync with the Father's will, to live meant to be on mission. Like, I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm terrible at living on mission. Yet Jesus would have undoubtedly been perfectly on mission every day. When I go to bed at night, I'd like to reflect on my day and do a bit of prayerful reflecting on the good things and thank God for those. And I try to repent of the things that haunt me, where I was sinful or got it wrong. I can't even imagine how long it would take to reflect on a day of perfect mission living. So imagine with me a vignette, brief, of a day in the life of Jesus. He wakes up and immediately has the sweetest prayer time with his father. He's energized, he's awake and ready to go. He leaves his house and as he's walking to his destination, he meets a man who wants to sell him something. Jesus instantly sees into his heart, shows him his sin, cuts to the chase, and the man believes and worships. Jesus rounds the corner and sees someone in need. He helps him, and in the process, God is glorified. He then happens upon a car accident. He pulls the man out of a flaming vehicle, and a crowd of onlookers are stunned by the events. Jesus gives a speech, and many more are saved. Jesus crosses the street, and he's finally left his block, and it's only 8.30 in the morning. And then there's me. Let's see, uh, Lord, I bought donuts for the office today. Um, I was mostly kind. Spent some time in your word. I waved to my neighbors as they walked by. I tried to love my children. That's all I got. Like, it's humbling. So when we think about what mission would have looked like for Jesus, I can imagine why John would write this. And it's not just a quantity thing, but indicative of the reality that Jesus, that what he did was infinite, including all that he's done to accomplish his purposes. But what I love about this verse the most is that it points to more. It points to more of Jesus. Like Moses, seeing just a glimpse of God pass before his eyes in the book of Exodus. This book is just a, but a glimpse of Jesus' magnificence and his majesty. He is the king of the universe, and we are just scratching the surface. In addition to forgiving and clearing the legal demands of our sin, he has restored us to a right relationship with God. He has made us sons and daughters with an eternal inheritance. He has given us a clear conscience and peace with God. Again, I could go on forever, but for sake of time, that's where I'll stop. Like I've already said, Believing in Jesus for the first time is just the ticket to the race. There's so much more. 
Believing that Jesus is the Son of God and choosing to follow him is like graduation. It may feel like a really big deal, but we call it commencement for a reason. It is a big deal, but it's just the starting point. Like when we graduate, we don't retire. We graduate and then we move on to whatever is next and better. And I remember when I was in my mid-20s and went through some serious pain and suffering. I remember feeling lost, alone, like my life was over. And then Jesus drew me back to himself. I committed, I was all in, and it's been almost 20 years of joy in Christ. It hasn't always been easy, but it's been good. And it's been joyful. And every day of my life is better than the last, which means every day of my life is the best day of my life. And the best part is that circumstance proof. Even on the hardest days, like when my mom died, or any of a number of other things, it didn't matter. It was a good day because I belonged to the king. His, ga- his grace has given me a settled joy that lasts and perseveres, a joy that can only come from life in Jesus. That's what I want for every one of you. So wrapping it all up, we've talked about Jesus and who he is and that we are being called to believe in him, which gives us life in his name. But as I've already mentioned, there's only so much time to talk and so many things to say. But I would be remiss not to talk a little bit more about why Jesus, why belief in Jesus is so crucial. It's because the Bible says that we have all sinned against God and that we are dead in our sins and in need of redemption. And that's where Jesus comes in. And that's why Jesus had to die. He took the death penalty for our sin as the perfect substitute and gives us his righteousness so that we can stand before a holy God Acknowledgement of our sin and belief in Jesus as the redemption of it is the only way to life in his name. It's as simple as that. At the end of the day, all the hard work that Jesus did saved us from so many things. And they're not small things. And just like when we talked about repentance earlier, that we turn from something to something, Jesus saves us from something to something. Jesus saves us from sin to righteousness. He saves us from death to life, from Satan to the Lord, from hell to be with him in heaven, from the holy wrath of God to the wonderful grace of God. Jesus saves us from striving to freedom, from futility to purpose, from self-absorption to service, from pain to joy, and he saves us from situational tumult to a settled peace. We've been saved to follow Jesus, to obey, and to do something. In Ephesians 2, Paul says that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that we should walk in them. Unless we forget, when we turn the literal page of our Bibles from John to Acts, We see Jesus ascend and the sending of the Holy Spirit who lives in believers. And it doesn't stop with the apostles. This same spirit lives in us and by grace gives us the power to obey day by day. We are not left on our own and we become free to put down the distractions, including the wait, the worry, and the what ifs and live free in Christ Jesus. It wasn't fair that Jada didn't have to do the cleanup. I did it for her. But just like I did the cleanup for her, Jesus cleaned up our mess. Thank God it's not fair. Because if it was based on fairness, we'd all be dead. But Jesus unfairly took the punishment so that we could unfairly have life. Therefore, I get to be thankful and enjoy the benefits of what he did on my behalf as I follow him experiencing life in his name. Thanks be to God. So the band can come on up. This life, this freedom, it all comes because of what Jesus did. And now we get to content, contemplate this together as we respond. You can respond in a couple of different ways, prayer and communion. My wife and I will be by the wall back there 
and there will be a couple prayer team members over there by the red tree. We would love to pray with you about literally anything. Also, you can pray right in your seats, or you can pray at the prayer bench over there along that wall. We are also going to take communion. Communion is a way for us to remember and declare together that we have peace and life with God through Jesus Christ. The bread represents the, blood, the body of Christ that was broken for us. The juice represents the blood of Christ shed for us. If you've chosen to believe, reflect on what the Spirit's stirring in you, confess, repent, rejoice, and respond. Consider the reflection questions on the screen. If you haven't yet committed to Jesus, if you're not a Christian, communion is not for you, but Jesus is, and so are we. We would love to talk with you and pray with you and answer any questions you may have. So let's close in prayer. God, thank you so much for this beautiful book that we've gotten to walk through to see what it looks like, to see what we're called to, to believe in you and have life in your name. God, help us to see your goodness. We pray for your joy amidst the struggles. God, help us to remember that we're created for your workmanship. Lord, we just thank you for this time today. Thank you for this beautiful group of people. In Jesus' name.